From the time that uh, many of us were young, we were taught some pretty important things. We were taught to work hard. We were taught to rely on ourselves, to rely on our, our own abilities. We were taught uh, to have personal strength and courage. Not bad qualities to have, right? But as much as we value these qualities, there is a danger that we, who have come to know Jesus Christ, will forget that we are dependent on him. We come to Christ by faith, don't we? Isn't that how we came? There was no other way to come. And so we came, and what did we bring? We brought a a broken and a sinful life. That's all we brought. But somehow when we become Christians, somehow we think that we can live this life independently of God. That we can do it on our own. That we can rely on ourselves to live for Him. And it's only when we fail Him or we disgrace Him that we once again realize That we're not only saved by grace, but that it is by grace that we stand. Isn't that what Paul said in Romans chapter 5? How little we really understand ourselves if we think that we can trust ourselves to stand. It is God who upholds us. He is the one who upholds us with his right hand. There really is no self-reliance. There is no self-confidence. There really is only reliance on Him and confidence in Him, in what He can do through us. And our failures are a painful reminder of that, aren't they? In an olive grove on a hill outside of Jerusalem, the disciples learned that painful lesson that would remain with them for the rest of their lives. It was a reminder that apart from Christ, apart from prayer, they could do nothing. For over two years, Jesus had been telling them and telling them and telling them over and over again that he was to go to Jerusalem. And he was to go there, and that he would be rejected by the people. He would be rejected by the religious leaders. He would be mocked. He would be scourged. And he would be crucified. He would be killed. But for two years, the disciples still didn't understand what he meant. Especially after they had just come into Jerusalem and the streets were lined with thousands and thousands of people, all of them waving palm branches, taking their cloaks off and putting them down on the road before him, shouting, screaming to him that he was their king. Who could stop that kind of momentum? Who could stop Jesus from becoming the king of Israel? Could the religious leaders? Could the Romans? The disciples had seen the power of Jesus. They had witnessed it firsthand. They knew his power came from above. They saw how he had power over nature. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Who could stand before that kind of power? Maybe they had misunderstood what Jesus meant about dying in Jerusalem. It's funny, we don't want to take the Lord at his word, do we? We want to explain it away. Maybe that's what the disciples were doing. They were explaining it away. Didn't make sense, did it? And so now as as Jesus is finishing his last meal with his disciples before he is about to suffer, he tells them that not only will he be brutally executed... He tells them that one of them, one of the twelve disciples, one of those men that he handpicked to follow him, one of those who was sitting around the table with him, sharing a meal, enjoying the fellowship, one of them 
would be the one to betray him, to hand him over to the authorities, and they would then kill him. And so as supper is ending, the betrayer, Judas, gets up from the table and he goes to do what Jesus just said that he would do. But no one but Christ knew where he went. No one but Christ understood what was going on. And so, Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. It says that after they had sung a hymn, Jesus and the eleven disciples got up. They left that upper room. They made their way through the crowded streets of Jerusalem, streets that were jammed with people because of the Passover. They went out of the city by the eastern gate. They crossed a ravine called Kidron, a place that filled with water during the rainy season. They made their way across that ravine and to the western slope of the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said something equally as upsetting. Verse 31. He told them that not only would he be killed, not only would one of them be the one to betray him, he said to them, all of you, he says, you will all fall away. Scandaliso, where we get our English word scandal, but originally it meant a, a trap, a snare that was used to catch animals. Jesus says, tonight you will be trapped, you will be snared by your own sin, by your own weakness. And he said it will be because of me, because of what I am about to suffer. He says this night, Within a few hours, none of you will be willing to stand with me. Well, at supper, they had just sworn their loyalty to Jesus. They had said that they would die with him. They had sworn their love and their undying affection for him. He was their Lord. It's their king. But Jesus tells them that their words will not line up with their actions this very night. They'll all be afraid of identifying themselves with him as he faces the enemy. And as he is taken, they will fear for their own lives. They'll run rather than risk their lives. They won't be willing to do that. But not only does he prophesy, and that's what it is, it's a prophecy, isn't it? And not only does he foretell what is about to happen and unfold that night, he says, but this night has been written about 500 years before this night ever occurred. He takes the disciples back to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, and he points out that the scripture there speaks about this night. The disciples are part of the scripture. He says, for it is written in Zechariah, I will strike down the shepherd, patasso in Greek, Hebrew, it's naka. It means that I will severely have the shepherd beaten and violently slaughtered. And verse 31 says then the sheep will be scattered. Diascopazo. It means that they will be scattered, shaken, and driven away. Jesus says that scripture speaks Of what will happen tonight. But he says, verse 32, after I have been killed, 
I'll rise from the grave. Just like I raised Lazarus from the grave, I'll rise again. And he says, after I have been raised, I will go before you. Don't fear what's about to happen. Don't be afraid. He says, I will have the victory and you will see me again when I call you to come to be with me in Galilee. You'll see me again. But I guess Peter wasn't paying attention. Or maybe his thoughts, uh, he was absorbed in his own thoughts about what Jesus had said about everyone falling away. He couldn't believe that. And he answered and he said to Jesus, even though all of these people, all of your disciples fall away from you. He says, I will never fall away. He says, I'm not like them. How many of us have had that same thought? We're not like the other followers of Christ. We're more committed. We're more spiritual. Only to find out that like Peter, that we are being sifted like wheat. But Jesus said in verse 34, truly, he said, truly I say this to you. He said that this very night before the cock crows, before a rooster crows, roosters started crowing around three in the morning. He says before that, within just a few hours, he says, you will deny me. He says, you will swear that you don't even know me and you won't do it once. He says, you will do it three times. But Peter couldn't see that, could he? He couldn't see his own weakness. He wasn't like the other disciples. All he could see was his own strength. And so Peter said to him, even if I have to to die with you, he says, I will not deny you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. None of them understood their weakness. They were unaware of how vulnerable they were. And they were unaware of the power and the strength of the enemy who was stalking them that night. They weren't aware that without Christ, without prayer, we can't face these difficulties in this life. We don't have the power. We don't have the strength. We need Christ. We need his strength because what will happen if we don't have him? We will run in fear and we'll be defeated. And that's the example we have before us this morning. So then, verse 36 says, Jesus came with these disciples to a place, to a garden, a grove, Grove on the Mount of Olives, about three quarters of a mile from Jerusalem, a place called Gethsemane. It's a word, uh, it's a Hebrew word. That means oil press. But to us, it's more than that. It's a word that speaks of, of grief. Of grief unlike grief that anyone has ever suffered before. There was no space in Jerusalem to have a garden or a grove or an orchard. So many people raised fruit, vegetables, in plots of ground on the Mount of Olives. And this was a place, we're told in John 18, too, where Jesus and his disciples often met. They often met in this garden, a time of rest, a time of prayer. And it's in this place, verse 36 says, that he said to his disciples, sit here, perhaps by the gate, by the entrance into this garden. And he said, sit while I go over there and I pray. Prosukomai in Greek. He said, sit here while I go and I lift up my voice to God. And it says he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. That would be James and John, right? And the four of them went a little further into the garden. And it says there in verse 37 that he began to be grieved 
lapio in Greek. He said, my mind, my heart, my body is full of sorrow. He said, I am, I am distressed. Adam O'Neill, he says, I am full of heaviness. And he said, my soul, my very being is, is deeply grieved. He says, Paralupos, I am surrounded by grief and sorrow. And I feel like that it is engulfing me. It's pressing in on me. He says, it's pressing into the point of death. He says, that's how I feel as I anticipate what is about to happen, what I am about to do. And so he said to Peter and James and John, he says, you remain here and keep watch with me. Luke 22 says uh, that he also said to them, keep watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. So you don't allow the enemy to use your weakness so that you fall into sin. That's how we're to handle trials, isn't it? We're to handle it that way. We are to come before God in prayer. That's our defense. That's our only defense. Fervent prayer. The disciples were at a crisis point. Jesus knew it. They didn't seem to know it, but he had just told them what was about to happen. Why is it so many times that we're in the middle of a spiritual battle? We don't even realize that we're in a battle until we're a casualty lying on the floor. For the disciples, it was their pride. It was their self-confidence that was their downfall. And so verse 39 says, he went a little beyond them. It says, uh, a stone's throw in Luke chapter 22, verse 41, about 30 yards So he's far enough away from them, but close enough for them to be able to see him, for them to be able to hear him. He's close enough to give them the ultimate example of how to emerge victoriously over great difficulty. That's the example. And he wants his disciples to see it. He wants us to see it. He's beginning to feel the weight. He's beginning to feel the burden of our sin. He's about to become sin. He's about to become our sin. And because of that, he is about to be abandoned by God. And he feels it coming down on him. He's about to suffer, so we will never have to suffer like that. And so, it says, verse 39, he fell on his face. He came before God, and it says he prayed, and he said, My Father, if it is possible, if it is possible that your will can be accomplished, and that the souls of men can be saved, and this cup, the cup of your wrath against sin, the cup that is about to fall on me? He said, if it is possible, then let it pass me. He said, let it pass from me. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Hear my cry. That's what it says in Psalm 102. It's a psalm that's been called the Psalm of Gethsemane. The reality of being separated from his father and taking our punishment is almost overwhelming. And yet he prays, verse 39, not as I will, but as thou will. Thy will be done. It's well after midnight by now. And verse 40 says that he came to his disciples and he saw Peter, he saw James, he saw John, And it says that he found them sleeping. They slept as the greatest spiritual battle that the world has ever seen is unfolding right in front of them. 
Luke 22, 45. Luke says that, uh, he was a physician. He says they were sleeping from sorrow. And so Jesus says to, to Peter, verse 40, and to the other disciples, so you men, you who claim to love me, you who, who not moments ago claimed that you would die for me, He said, you couldn't even keep watch with me for an hour. You all fell asleep. He said in verse 41, keep watching. Keep praying. Be on the alert. Be vigilant, he said. Keep lifting your voice up to God like I'm lifting my voice up to God so that you don't fall into temptation. He said, your heart. Your mind, the spirit within you is, is willing. He said, I know that you have that desire in your heart to do what's right. He says, but your human nature, the frailty of your flesh is weak. And so, he says, you seek to satisfy your flesh, your selfishness. It's a battle, he says. It's a struggle. It's a struggle everyone faces, including the disciples that night. And Jesus says the only way that you will have victory over this is through prayer. Diligent prayer. Don't fall asleep. Pray. And then he went away a second time and said, verse 42, And he prayed and he said again, he said, my father, if this, this cup, the cup of your wrath is the only way to save these people, to save us, he said, then if it cannot pass from me, unless I drink it, unless I suffer, Unless I allow myself to be murdered and you abandon me. He said, if that is what it takes to save you and me, he says, if that is what it takes, he says, thy will be done. And again, it says, he came to his disciples and what did he find? Again. They're sleeping. It said, because their eyes were heavy, bareo, their eyes were weighted down. Not with sin, but weighted down with sleep. And so he left again, it says, and he prayed again. And it says, for a third time, he said the same thing. What was that? Thy will be done. That's true prayer. You know, true prayer isn't when we try to change God's mind. True prayer is when we bring our will into alignment with God's will. That when we pray, our desires are really His desires. That our prayers are consistent with His will, with the will of our Father in Heaven. Isn't that what Jesus did? He brought His will into alignment with the will of God the Father. He said, thy will be done. And when we start to do that, we will find the enemy will be right behind us, trying to get us off track, trying to keep us from doing the will of God, whispering in our ear. Do you ever notice how when you start to pray sometimes, you're a lot more sleepy, aren't you? Why is that? You start to hear sounds, you start to be distracted. Why is that? The enemy wants to take us off track. He wants to keep us from praying. He knows the power of prayer, perhaps more than we do. But he knows that there is power with God, with Christ, when God's people pray in the will of God. And so he opposes us. Look what he did with the disciples. We have an example right here, don't we? Christ was victorious over temptation. Why? Because he prayed. And the disciples... They failed because they didn't pray. 
And then Luke 22, 43 through 44 says that an angel appeared to Christ. And he ministered to him. Why? He said, because the blood vessels in his face began to break. Because it was so intense. His prayer was so fervent that it began to mix with his sweat and fall to the ground like blood. That is intense prayer. Intense prayer in an intense situation. Then verse 45 says, He came to the disciples for the third and for the last time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping? Are you still taking your rest? He says, verse 45, Behold, it's too late to pray. That time has passed. The hour, he says, the moment of time that I have warned you about all along has now come upon you. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise! Get up! Get on your feet! He says, and let us be going and let us face the enemy. For the one who betrays me is at hand. Christ was prepared to face the enemy because he had prayed. The disciples weren't prepared to face the enemy, were they? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. But he stood and he went and he faced the enemy. And while he was still speaking, it says in verse 47, Behold, Matthew says, Judas, one of the twelve, could have referred to him a lot of other ways, couldn't he? But he didn't, did he? He just said, one of us. It's almost like he's, he's in unbelief. How could one of us betray our Savior? He says, he came up. And he was accompanied by a great multitude with clubs and with swords. Those who had been sent from the chief priests and the elders of the nation. Luke 22 tells us that there were chief priests and elders and officers in that crowd. John chapter 18 tells us there were also Romans. It says a Roman cohort, a battalion. A full battalion with 600 men. It was a great multitude, Matthew says. Oculos polos. It was a huge army of men standing before Christ. And it was dark. It was after midnight. And even with lanterns and with torches, it would have been difficult to identify Jesus. They might not have even known what Jesus looked like. Nobody had photographs. And so Judas, he who was betraying him, Matthew reminds us, gave them a sign, a signal. And here's the signal. Whomever I I shall kiss, he's the one. Seize him. Frateo, use your strength. Use the strength of your numbers. Use the strength of your weapons. And grab him and hold him and arrest him. Slave would would kiss the feet of his master. A disciple would kiss the cheek of his teacher. It was a sign of, of respect. It was a sign of affection, of love. It was a sign of submission. None of those things Judas had for Christ. And so verse 49 says, immediately he went up to Jesus. And he said to him, hail, Rabbi, my master, my teacher, my friend. That's what he said. And then it says, Judas kissed him, katafileo. He embraced him. And he kissed him on the cheek over and over again. 
with what appeared to be warmth and love and devotion and affection, but deceitful and excessive are the kisses of an enemy. That's what it says in Proverbs 27, 6. And so Jesus said to him, friend, Hetarios, it's not really friend. It's more like associate. Someone that he knew. Someone that he recognized. That's how Jesus addressed him. And he said to him, do what you have come to do. Stop the hypocrisy. Stop the, the pretense. Stop the lies. Stop your kisses and your words. They betray your wicked heart. And then Jesus, we're told in John chapter 18, verses 4 through 6, spoke to the crowd. No one's arrested Jesus yet. The sign's been given. But Jesus is still in control of the situation. Not the crowd, not Judas. And so Jesus addresses the crowd And he says to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. I am God Almighty. It is God who stands before you. And the text says this. What was their reaction? They drew backward and fell to the ground. All of them fell to the ground. Hundreds of men, trained soldiers, professionals, all fell to the ground just by the name, just by the mention of the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. There's power in him. He's God. He never loses control of the situation. What did he say in John 10? No one, no one takes my life from me. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay it down that I might take it up again. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's still the Lord God. He's still the maker of heaven and earth, our Savior. A redeemer. And then, it says in verse 50, then he allowed them to lay their hands on him. So, we are told, then, and only then, they seized him. And behold, Matthew says in verse 51, one of those who was with Jesus, well, it's no surprise who that was, is it? John tells us who it was. It was Peter. Who else? Peter reached into his cloak and he pulls out a sword. And he he struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. I don't know if he was aiming for his ear. But that's where his blade landed. And then Luke 22 tells us that Jesus touched that ear. And that man was healed. Jesus maintains control of the situation. Even while he's being arrested. And then Jesus said to Peter, verse 52, put your sword away. He says, for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Violence, he says, can't accomplish the will of God. It can't accomplish God's plans. He said it will only lead to punishment for those who take the law into their own hands. How foolish, Jesus says. How foolish that you would think to defend the God of the universe with a sword? He said, don't you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12,000 legions of angels? That's 72,000 angels. Second Kings chapter 19, we're told that one angel killed 185,000 men in one night. 
God doesn't need our weapons. His victories are from his power alone. In fact, Jesus points out that if you had been paying attention to the teaching that I have been giving you over these past few years, you would understand that your fighting against this situation is actually not opposition against me. He says it's opposition against God. It's opposition against God. He's saying, how can the scriptures be fulfilled? Verse 54. How can they be fulfilled unless all this happens this way? It's part of the plan of redemption. Don't fight it. If you had been in prayer, you would know. You would have your will aligned with the will of God. What if the prophet Isaiah said he he would be a man who would be despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He would be afflicted and smitten of God. He would be pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, slaughtered like a lamb. You may not know it, Jesus told his disciples, but your lack of prayer and your impulsiveness, and your overconfidence. Confidence in yourself. He says it's actually working against the plan of God. That's a pretty strong indictment. So then, verse 55, Jesus addresses the crowd again as they're standing there waiting for him so they can arrest him. And he said to them, have you come out with swords and with clubs? To arrest me as against a robber, like someone who sneaks around in the dark, a criminal? He says, you're a bunch of cowards. He said, every day I used to sit in the temple and I used to teach you. You didn't seize me then, did you? He said, but whatever your motives are. He said, all this has taken place so that... The scriptures of the prophets, the prophets that you read about in the scriptures, the scriptures that you quote all the time. He said, all of this is happening so that their words might be fulfilled. And I, he said, am the fulfillment of those words. And then Luke adds another thought. Luke 22, verse 53. He ended this way with them. But this is your hour. And the power of darkness is yours. But no one could see that. No one understood that. Not even the disciples. And then verse 56 says this. All the disciples left him. All of them fled. And Christ faced the cross alone. He faced it with courage. He faced it with confidence. He faced it with faithfulness. He faced it with obedience. That is our Savior. That is our Lord. By His grace we're saved. By His grace we stand. And by His grace we will see Him, our Lord, our God, and our King forever. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.